Welcome to our latest Book Reporter Talks to interview, where our guest today is Lisa C., the New York Times bestselling author of The Island of Sea Women, which is now out in paperback, and it's a Book Reporter Bets on selection. Right here. Um, I've been a reader of Lisa's work, and this is always fun because I get to go through my house and find books, since Snowflower and the Secret Fan, a book that sent me immediately to Google to figure out what foot binding looked like and sent me down a whole path of doing that. Um, Lisa and I were to meet in Tucson to be talking about this book at the Tucson Festival of Books, but I'm happy that we're able to do this today, even though I wish we were eating fish tacos at the same time, because that would be eminently fun. So welcome, Lisa. Thanks for having me. I wish, I do wish though we were having fish tacos. That's one of the first times we got together was sitting by your hotel pool and doing that. Yes, during the LA Times Festival of Books, I used to fly out a day early so Lisa and I could sit by the pool and eat fish tacos and chat. <laughs> so it was like my favorite part of the year. So for years, your books have been celebrated for their authentic, deeply researched stories about Chinese characters and cultures. So what drew you to write about the free diving women of South Korea's Jeju Island and the Island of Sea Women? Totally different location. Totally different. And, um, you know, the way I came to it is sort of odd. I was now about 10 years ago, I was sitting in a doctor's office and, you know, how you're flipping through magazines waiting to be called in. And I came across one really small article, just one paragraph, one tiny photo about these diving women and I just thought they were so amazing and I had that same feeling that I had actually like when I started working on um, Snowflower and the Secret Fan which was how could this exist and I didn't know right. and then okay. how could this exist and we all didn't know so I ripped it out of the magazine and I took it home and um, but it still took about another eight years before I decided this is the one. This is the story to end up writing. But I, know but I actually didn't answer your question <laughs> <laughs> completely because, you know, the, what attracted me to them is that this is a, a, a macrofocal society, so a society focused on women on this island where the women are free divers. They take deep breaths, they dive down about 60 feet, they stay underwater two, three, four minutes, unbelievable amount of time. And they harvest seafood. So they're the ones who are the breadwinners in their families and their husbands take care of the kids, do the cooking, take care of the house. You know, so it's, it's this kind of incredible role reversal. I had never thought about what a matrifocal society was. I had never known anything about it until I started reading this book. And it was really interesting how the children are so looking for their moms at the end of the day, be they have to be breastfed or they have, you know, they just want to be bonding with their moms because dads have been in charge all day long. And they basically sit around the house. The women still do everything when they get home. Right. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> so I know you travel to meet some of these free diving women. It's called the Hanyo. Hanyo, do I have it correct? Mm -hmm. Um, so what was that like, going to meet these people who are not spring chickens anymore? No, you know, that was part of what pushed me to write the book, you know, finally decide this is the one, is that um, now, I guess it's about five years ago that UNESCO gave them this designation of an intangible world heritage tradition. And part of the reason they did that was that they're expecting that this culture is going to disappear off the earth within about another 10 years. Wow. So, you know, these divers, most of them are in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. And I just felt like, well, I cannot wait 5, 10, 15 years to go and do this. Anyway, so some of the interviews were things that were set up in advance. I got to go to people's houses and, you know, we'd sit on the floor and drink tea. And they, they have this special orange that grows on Jeju Island and we eat these little oranges. And so these, those were really in-depth interviews. Some of them lasting, you know, six, eight hours. Wow. Then there were some where, um, well, I'd go to where the women were going into the sea at the beginning of the day, where they were coming out. And these women, you know, they're, they're quite loud. Their ears have been really damaged by being under the sea their whole lives. Um, but, and they also really brag. And they also just, um, they're working women. So if I walked up and said, oh, you know, can I talk to you for a little while? They'd be either like, yeah, sit down or go away, I'm busy. <laughs> and so they were just really very direct. And then the third group of women are, uh, were these women who are either semi-retired 
fully retired or maybe recovering from an injury who sit on the beach and um, they they sort the seaweed and and um, that's you know washed ashore overnight mm -hmm. and so they were great you know these were really much older women and they sit on these they have these little cushions which they tie onto their rear ends so they're sitting there with their knees kind of up like this and um, they have these big bonnets that look sort of like American pioneer bonnets and they were wonderful and I actually loved those interviews so much that as you know the book starts with an old woman sitting on the beach sorting and collecting the, the algae that's washed ashore. You know, it's, this is hazardous work, but they see it as freeing. I mean, I'm not sure if I would think about diving 60 feet down as something that would be freeing. But for them, it was a way to really be their own people, to be right. their own people and be the providers of their families. And it was, it was just such interesting reading. Did you try any free diving when you were in Korea? No. <laughs> and here's what, I mean, I can swim, but right. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not at that level. And uh, what I did do uh, was I would practice in the pool, like how long I could hold my breath under. <laughs> right. And it's really hard, you know, it's really hard to do that. And when I've gone out and given talks, you know, I do it that I actually got my phone right here, but I'll, you know, I, I do a breathing thing with the audience where I, we all take deep breaths together, they hold their breath and I time them, I keep talking and I time them to see how, how long they can hold their breath. And most are about, at about 45 seconds. Um, you know, a lot, a few get to about 100, a, a minute and 15 once. I had a woman who got to a minute 45, but she'd been a swimmer in high school. And so, I, you know, I, I just, when, when we do that, I mean, people who are watching, they can time themselves, you know, and just see what that feels like. And then to imagine, that you're on the bottom of the ocean floor. And let's say you're not the best diver. You know, you're not the kind who can hold your breath for three or four minutes. You're what would be called the baby diver. And you can hold your breath pretty easily for two minutes. But maybe last night you didn't sleep very well, or you know, you were worried about something, or you didn't get enough to eat, or you had a fight with your husband. And so today you're just not feeling yourself. You know, and you're just not feeling like you should, and there you might be, you know, right on the bottom of the floor. Ordinarily, you could hold your breath for two minutes, but today it's only a minute and a half or a minute and 45 seconds, and you still have 30, 40 feet to get to, to air. So, you know, it's, a, it's very dangerous work. Yeah, and I tried this morning because I was remembering when you did it with the live event that I was at, and I got to 50 minutes today. But I remember when we were Not doing minutes, it. minutes, seconds. If you did 50, 50 minutes, you yeah, well, get on the record. record. 50 seconds, 50 seconds. But um, I remember the day that we were at the event, I was thinking we were so far in, you go 30 seconds. And I was like, oh no, it's only 30 seconds. But if you try it, I mean, for anybody who's watching, if you try this later on, you'll see how difficult it is because you're thinking, oh, they're underwater three minutes. What's that? Like if I swim across a pool, I can do that. It's not the same thing. It's just really not the same. So um, again, you're writing about two women who are friends, something that is really a central theme in your book. So tell us about Miha and Young Suk. So tell us about them and why you chose them as characters. Well, first, just, you know, I actually almost always start a book with three ideas. You know, what's the historic backdrop? What's the main emotion that I want to have go through it? And then what's the relationship? So I, you know, I've written a lot about mothers and daughters and sisters and best friends for life. And this just, this story really lent itself to, to have best friends because the divers do follow a kind of buddy system. Mm -hmm. So your life is literally in someone else's hands every single day and their life is in yours. And so that made a lot of sense to me. The other thing I was really thinking about, uh, there's a, a aphorism called, um, that goes like, um, no, if you, if you plant red beans, you'll raise red beans. So that like who you are as a child is who you're going to grow up to be. And I really was thinking a lot about that idea with Young Suk and Nija. So Young Suk, she is the daughter of the chief of the diving collective. And so it's expected that, you know, she's gonna grow up. She's gonna take her mother's place. Her future looks really good. 
you know, and very positive. And then Mija, she is the daughter now orphan of Japanese collaborators. And so people always look at her with a certain amount of suspicion. Of could they ever really trust her? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, in my, in a lot of my stories, I have kind of explored this idea of fate and destiny, but this time, you know, certainly fate and destiny are in there, but I also really wanted to think about free will mm -hmm. and, you know, these two girls who have, have sort of like a stamp, you know, they each have a kind of stamp on their forehead from childhood that can they break through that? Can that actually change by what they do? Yeah, it's, and it was just so interesting because it also takes place over a long span of time from 1938 to 2018, which a lot of your books do that would take place over a long time, which gives readers a real perspective on the time periods and what people are doing for them. Do you outline the books in advance because so much is time sensitive? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I have to. So, yeah. so actually, I, it, there are a couple of different things. So one is all of those events that I can't move around, right? Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, Korea, I mean, in the scope of this book, there's Jap when Korea is a Japanese colony, World War II, um, uh, the, you know, when Korea was divided into North and South, the Korean War and the 4-3 incident, all of these things. So they have very specific dates and other dates that are sort of more world dates. Like I can't move around the date that Hiroshima was bombed. Right. I can't move what, what I wrote about in the book, the 4-3 incident, because it's right in the name. 4-3 is April 3rd. So, mm -hmm. you know, I can't move those around, but they kind of become like signposts along the way. And then as I'm doing my research, I will find things where I'll just say, oh, I've got to use that. So you know, an example in this book is that um, abalone, abalone are, the, are one of the most dangerous things to harvest. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, and when I read that and why, I just thought, ooh, I, I, I got to use that, you know. And so then it really, but that's flexible, right? It could be at the beginning of the book, it could be in the middle, it could be and why do I put it where I put it? But that also becomes a signpost. Mm -hmm. And then the third category is just has to do with the characters in real life. And, you know, if you have two little girls who meet, well, they're going to meet if you, you know, want them to meet when they're little girls, they've got to be little girls. Uh, if people fall in love and get married and have a baby, you know, well, typically takes about nine months to have a baby, mm -hmm. right? right. right. So, th but those, so those, also can be somewhat flexible and those also become like signposts for me mm -hmm. and so when i sit down to write i don't know i don't have it plotted out how i'm going to get from here to that first signpost that's to me sort of the the magic of writing is that's you know when the fun stuff happens or mm -hmm. the or sort of the imagination is working and you're tapping into the you know universe of creativity you hope um, but I know at least where I'm going. And mm -hmm. so that's that. So that's how it works for me. I know every writer has different ways, but that's how I think of it. Yeah. And I was always trying to figure out because it's like certain things do have to happen in some kind of a chronological order. And then the right. action in between has to have its own highs and lows. You know, mothers and daughters. Can I just tell you a funny thing? Sure. So there was a, a you know, writers are always shifting um, scenes around, you know, we cut, we paste, we move. Oh, we didn't like that there. We'll move it over here. And so I can't remember which book it was, but it was, you know, a while ago. And the copy editor sent, you know, had a note saying, do you, do you realize that this woman has been pregnant for 22 months? <laughs> <laughs> it's the things you miss. Yeah, the things you miss. And it was like, well, I just cut and pasted. <laughs> There was an author once who um, gave me a manuscript to read, and I said, the little boy was in the hospital at one, was visiting at the hospital at one point, and she said, yes, I said, he's still there. <laughs> and she oh. said, I didn't realize that, and I said, yeah, he's there for a really long time. Yeah. <laughs> mothers, mothers and daughters are also very prominent in your book, and you t tackle tough relationships between mothers and daughters, as well as the joys, but you, like me, have sons. 
And is it really interesting to be writing these different relationships about the mother-daughter relationship when we both know the mother-son relationship so much better? Yes, we have mothers, but it's different. Um, I, well, I actually think it is about having a mother, you know, that I, and I do think, I mean, I certainly have a lot of friends who have daughters and I can certainly imagine what it would be like to have a daughter, but mainly I was a daughter. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, that to me, I, I, I don't know, I'd have to really think about this through all the books, but I feel like most of the relationships with the mothers are more from the daughter's perspective. They I could are. be wrong. I think they are. Yeah, go look. I was thinking about that this morning because a lot of it is how the daughters feel about their mothers or what they're mm -hmm. thinking about their mothers or the what their mothers have put on them as restrictions that they are right. trying to get beyond exactly. or the way they've had to live their lives. Yeah, that's certainly true. that's true in The Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane. I think even in this book, you know, the different, there are quite a few mothers in this particular book. Um, but also, I, now that I'm thinking about it, you know, Jung Suk has a daughter, first a daughter, but then later, you know, her sons. And her sons, she has more of a relationship with her sons that she, she has a kind of cultural thing, of course, that sons are so important. But it, it was harder for her to actually make connections to her daughters, even though she does in time, you know, it did not all of them work out. And then also Mija has a son and mm -hmm. he's her whole life. And so, um, you know, I, it's interesting to me to think about that, 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 um, yeah, that, that, that their relationships are better with their sons and with their, their daughters. Daughters. Yeah, I don't know. I was just something that I was thinking about just because I relate so much to having sons. Yeah. I mean, when I have children, somebody said, do you want to have a daughter? And I said, I always want to have sons. I mean, that was, I just thought, I thought they're going to be easier. I'm not so sure some days. <laughs> <laughs> so in the book, there's a terrible event that happens on April 3rd, 1947. And I was thinking this morning, it makes it really interesting. We're talking on April 2nd, 2020, oh. almost 73 years later. So tell us about what happens because it's such a changing point in what happens on Jeju. Right. So uh, right after the end of the uh, World War II, um, you know, when the Japanese lost, so they lost Korea as a colony. And then Korea was divided into North and South by Britain, United States, and um, and, and Russia. And so Russia was going to have control of the North you know, sort of administrative control, and we would have administrative control of the South. And we said, you know, we, we're going to bring you democracy. Unfortunately, we have not had a great track record in bringing countries democracy. But anyway, we brought it, and we said, we're going to let you have your own free elections. Would have been the first time on, that, on the peninsula that they would have ever had elections, let alone free. But, you know, we provided the one candidate, and he of course, was elected and became a brutal dictator. But in the days leading up to this, people were like, yeah, we do want to have our own free elections. So there, there were these demonstrations on the mainland, but also on the island. And on the island, things started to escalate and get out of control until finally on 4-3, April 3rd, um, this was the start of what would become an eight-year massacre of the people mm -hmm. of the island, and during which between 30 and 80,000 people were killed. And then after that eight years, the government censored the event. And so you couldn't talk about it. You couldn't write about it. Mm -hmm. um, you couldn't be in your kitchen, you know, chopping vegetables for lunch and talk about it. And somebody walked by and if they heard you, you could be arrested, sent to jail, um, tortured, killed, and so could everyone else in your family. So you had the eight years plus this 50 years of secrecy. And... Um, you know, we talked earlier about the three things that I always start with, and one of them is the emotion. And for me, for this book, it's forgiveness. And um, today, this island, even though it has had this very dark period, it's now seen internationally or recognized internationally as the island of peace. And it's mm -hmm. actually ranked with um, Rwanda and South Africa as sort of international models for how to forgive. 
Wow. And so I, you know, the thing about forgiveness is, you know, we all know it works on so many levels. It's one-on-one, -on -one, it's within families, it's with your impossible neighbor, it's sometimes communities or cultures or countries. And so there are all these different levels. And so um, because, you know, it, because of, well, when I learned about the fourth grade incident, that's when I knew that I wanted to set the book somewhere in that because I already knew that I had wanted to write about forgiveness. Um, am I talking too much? I wanted to, can I say no. one more? Yeah, yeah no, so no, no. what I was gonna say about forgiveness is I feel like it's something that I've kind of been skirting around in a lot of, in different books. So you had mentioned earlier, Snowflower and the Secret Fan, and you know, I'm going to strip this down to its barest, right? Two best friends, a bad thing happens, but they're never, and they're split apart, and they're never able to forgive each other. Mm -hmm. um, Lily, really, the last bit of the novel is really about atonement, but she can never have true forgiveness. Um, in uh, Shanghai Girls, two sisters, a bad thing happens, they're split apart. They were so split apart that I ended up writing a sequel. Mm -hmm. right. And um, and they do find forgiveness, but they're literally on separate continents. They don't have any interaction. They have to do it on their own. And it's only on the last page, big giveaway here, that they see each other, but they still haven't had a chance yet to talk. So I could, you know, I, I could just go through all the books to see how this is something I've kind of skirted around. And so when I started The Island of Sea Women, I knew that I wanted to, I mean, long before I knew the history of the island that I wanted to write about forgiveness and just try to really look at it straight on. Mm -hmm. And what does it take to forgive? What does it take to be forgiven? Yeah, and, and somewhere along the way during your research, you found this 800 page document about the massacre. What was it like when you were reading that? Was it was an amazing, like, you know, really history of what had happened? Yeah, so this is a uh, uh, document, um, you know, it's the Human Rights uh, Report, and it's still an ongoing um, investigation. It's been going on for over 10 years now, and so they keep adding to it. And they have interviewed people on, you know, literally all around the world. They had access to Korean um, military and government documents, access to United States archives, uh, you know, both the government and the military archives. And then they interviewed victims, they interviewed perpetrators. I mean, they just really got everyone. And the, some of it, like you said, it's very interesting, sort of the history of it, and, and to see how things did slowly escalate, because all of that's mapped out in there. But some of the things that happened were so horrifying and so terrible. And those are images that I really wish I could just scrub right out of my head, you know, that, they, that they'll be in there forever. And they were really, really hard for me to, to read. And, um, but, you know, there were also things where there, uh, there's a scene in the book where uh, the two women are on this, have been gathered as part of a whole village. And this was one of the, um, this is based on the true, on, on what actually happened to this village of Bukshan uh, that had one of the largest number of deaths. So the whole village has been gathered together and Young Suk and Mija are sort of creeping around trying to find Young Suk's husband. And they come to the edge of the crowd where um, there's a gathering of all of the officers sitting inside an ambulance um, to talk about what are they going to do? You know, they, they just burned down the village. What well, now? What are they going to do with all these people? And that scene in the book, and mo almost all of the dialogue comes from the real life driver of the ambulance. Wow. Who who told the so, story? Yeah. What to do? You know, when I was at one of your events last year where there was this elderly Korean man in the audience. I remember he was up in the front row. And he was so passionate about your writing of this incident and what it had meant to him mm -hmm. to have validated what had happened all those years ago. And it was such an emotional moment at the event. 
And I'm wondering, did you see anything else like that along the way, or was that an anomaly? Or did, have people spoken to you about it, you know, what this if writing about this meant to them? Yeah, I mean, that gentleman, he had really, you know, he knew so much about it. And he's actually written to me since and, and mm -hmm. has sent me some of his own research. Um, he was a professor. But it's interesting, you know, because the book has been published in Korea. And of course, we have a lot of Korean Americans here. And it, because this incident was such a secret, you know, and it really was, I mean, under threat of death, you know, to you and your family. Um, and the way that the government sort of kept that going was through propaganda. So it was always something, oh, that's just something people made up. You know, it's sort of like saying, you know, the moon landing was fake, mm -hmm. right? Um, so there are a lot of people, especially in, you know, South Korea, who this is new with new to them, you know, or they, it's only just started to come out uh, over the last 10 years. And the only other story that I know about that takes place during this time period was a, was a short story that was written in the 1970s and that writer was sent to, to prison for, for wow. publishing. Wow, 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 wow. You know, you have this great line where you've said that the most resonant naturalistic fiction takes place in a recognizable world and a recognizable landscape, but you've got to turn it into fiction. Is that a challenge to you when you're writing that you're, you know that you want to stay true to what's going on and be recognizable, but really put this fabulous layer of fiction on top of it? Well, that's the trick, isn't it? <laughs> really, the <laughs> That's trick. the challenge. And, I, you know, I mean, even if you could just think of the actual physical landscape, this is why it's so important for me to go to every place mm -hmm. that I write about. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, it's, it's like when you go on vacation and let's say you step off the plane in Hawaii, you know right away you're not where you can't, you know, you're in a new place because you have the, the, that breeze, you know, the sounds are different, they have different birds, um, you have, of course, ocean all around you. So there's something, I, I mean, I just really feel that when you go someplace, you actually feel it, it you, you take it in with all of your senses. You know, what does it smell like? What does it sound like? What, what does it look like? Well, how, how does it look here in the morning as opposed to, you know, at midnight? And, and so people often tell me that they think of the landscape or the city or the town, whatever it is, wherever I'm writing about, almost like a character. Right. And, I, and I very much feel that way, that if I can create that you know, because it's their only words, right? I, I mean, if I could put in photos, that'd be great. Be but great. you have to try to create that world with the words. And again, for me, it's using all of the senses um, that, that I think help, I hope. I don't know. No, I think it completely does because you you clearly feel immersed in every single book you've read. I can re written. I remember exactly how I felt when I was reading it, the emotions, whatever. Once a book is done, do those characters stay with you or do you move on? They not only stay with me, but they talk. And so, you know, I'll just say some of my characters are not very nice or they're a little snippy. And, um, you know, everyone's, and I really, I like to think I'm a pretty nice person. So, you know, it's usually one of those other characters who'll say, yeah, that, that, that. Yeah, I, mean, I don't. Nice. It doesn't come out of my mouth, but they'll, they're thinking it in there, and I think, oh, oh, Pearl, be quiet. <laughs> that was that was really mean. That wasn't the thing to say. That wasn't the thing to say. You know, you've always looked for stories that have been lost or forgotten or not spoken about enough. Like you found that little clipping the day that you were in the doctor's office. Do you have a file of ideas of I want to write I it out? Say I, I do have a file. It's true, but. Um, I also have some stuff over on this bookcase over here. If you look, actually, I have a shelf. Uh, it's one, two, three, three up. That just has books on on topics that I've thought about writing about. You know that I slowly collect. So right. some things can be as small as something I ripped out of a magazine or a newspaper, and then over the years, you know, if I, I I collect stuff on that until you know, hopefully there's a time. When, when I finished um, The Island of Sea Women, I 
took, I actually took some time, three months off. And I thought, I'm just really going to think about what I want to write next. And so I pulled out every idea that I've had. And they were, I mean, all over the place in here. And um, made a list of them. And there were 29. Wow. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And, really and, you know, but there's a reason there's 29. Because some of them, they have real problems to them. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So like one of them is something I've thought about for a really, really, really long time. And like I said, I've got stuff up there on the shelf about her. They're the greatest pirate in the history of the world was a Chinese woman. Really? And she had something like 24,000 men under her, you know, under, under her command. And I think, I mean, how, how amazing is that? You know, the greatest pirate in the history of the world. But there's a big problem, which was, you know, she was a pirate. She wasn't very nice. She was a pretty horrible human being. And so I, I haven't figured out, you know, how to, I don't think I could write something from her perspective. Right. Um, Maybe the nice sister. <laughs> yeah, she, she had the good sister. That's true. The good sister pirate. <laughs> the, good, the good sister of the pirate who is yeah. trying to explain why the pirate is the way she is, you right. know? Right. Oh, anyway, there's some that, you know, have those kinds of problems where it's just like, I'd love to write that, but I haven't found my way in. Your way in it. You know, on the site for each of your books, you have this step inside section where you have fabulous research, articles, photos, just everything that will enhance the reading experience. Um, what drew you to put that on the site? And do you add things like as you're researching, do you say add this into step into later or do you go back at the end? So actually how that originally started was there was, um, I live pretty close to a university here and one of the teachers assigned the class to create websites on a, on a book oh, and wow. like a step in, you know, a step it's yeah. where they would say, uh, and that was for um, Shanghai girls. And so they found photos of the original location and what it looks like today and they had all kinds of stuff and the teacher the professor sent it to me and asked if they could put it up on their university website I was like sure but can I put it on my website too and then I asked those girls um, if they would do one for I can't remember what the next book was but they did the second one for me and then after that you know I've just we've just been doing it from here and so I do I, I say that I keep a list next necessarily but you know I'm also collecting stuff for myself mm -hmm. so with the island of sea women you know just from my own research I tried to find every video out there you know that I could any kind of clipping uh, one of my favorites is a documentary I'm gonna say from like the 1950s or early 1960s following a little girl as she's training Oh, and wow. it's, you know, in black and white mm -hmm. and you see her in the morning, she straps her brother to her back and she goes out to collect firewood and she goes out to haul water. And, you know, certainly I got to see what that looked like. So when I had um, Young Sook doing that, you know, I really had a visual of what that was like. But the other thing that happened in this little video, is there's one scene where the little girls are all on a bench together on the boat, on a boat. And they've just come out of the water and they're just, just you know, huddled together, shivering, no blanket, no jacket, no towel, it's windy, they're freezing, and it's like, oh, I, I yeah, this, I get this, and this is how they learned how to withstand that cold from such a young age. So anyway, I, I really like putting all of these things, yeah, I mean, great. I'm pulling them together for myself, mm -hmm. so um, then I can put the best of the videos that I've found, or, or documentaries, and of course I have photos from my own trip, and um, things like they have a very special cloth that they make on this island and all the clothes are made out of it. I mean, it's just a dye where they dye any kind of fabric in um, unripened persimmon juice. Oh, wow. So when I was there, I went and uh, I met a woman. She's actually more of a, like a fashion designer, but she has, she, so she's doing something a little higher end. 
but she took me through every step of the dyeing process. I helped hang out stuff. I mean, I really learned how to do it. And so I, you know, I have a section in Step Inside the World of Sea Women, you know, about her and about the dyeing process. So all of these things, including, you know, a recipe and stuff for your book club. When we were in New York for the Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane, we went to a fabulous tea, uh, uh, see what's it, a tea house near my office, and we drank pu'er tea with great ceremony. So what have you been hearing about readers after they read that book? And now you have tea for the uh, new book as well, Korean tea. Yeah, so um, my husband was the one who said, you know, a lot of people won't have heard of this tea and they're going to be curious about it. And so the woman who I had traveled to China with, uh, who has her own tea company, she created a little tea tasting package for book clubs um, that had, I think, four different types of pu'er so that, you know, in your book club, you could all try it together. And then for this book, she introduced me to a Korean tea master who in her family, they have been Korean tea masters since the year 843. Wow. So I guess they know what they're <laughs> They know what they're doing, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so she did a Korean tea package with some little Korean snacks, um, you know, a, a candy and a little cookie, enough for a group of 10, plus a recipe of for how to make your own Korean tea snack. And people have really loved these in book clubs. And, um, yeah, but, you know, quite apart from book clubs, I do hear from different tea shops around the country, not that I know them, but they'll write to me and say, you know, all these people are coming in looking for poor. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and and uh, I've even done a couple of events now with, with tea shops because they've had so many customers come in and, and because they've read that book, The Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane. I remember the day we were trying it was like, do you like the raw better? Do you like this? And I was really thinking about the taste of tea, which I had really not given much thought to, except it was, you know, is it um, caffeinated or not caffeinated? Before? Right. It's such distinct tastes and such distinct flavors, the way it was on your palate, the front of your tongue, the back or whatever. It was so interesting. Well, so. it really is like wine tasting in, mm -hmm. in a sense. Like, And with wine, you know, you go from those really light colored ones all the way to you know, like a Chenin Blanc all the way to some really fabulous Cabernet. And, and Pu'er is exactly the same. You can have some, it's super, super light. In fact, I'm actually drinking some right here. This one's very, very light. And it will go from looking actually sort of like, a, again, a Chenin Blanc all the way to looking like a black, black cup of coffee. Cup of coffee tea. I know when we met with you with our book group, we um, had gotten some of the tea and it was so much fun because it just adds the experience. And also for us ever hosting, it's a built-in thing of what to do. Like you don't yeah. have to sit there and say, what am I going to go get? This is right. you know really wonderful. Um, something I did not know. And so I started doing research for this interview that you were born in Paris. How old were you when you moved to LA? Six weeks. Oh, okay. My parents were, they were just students. You know, my, my dad had been in the army and my mom came and met him and um, I was born there and I lived in the a dresser drawer. I, and, uh, it was my first crib. And then they came home. Oh, okay. Okay. So I was thinking, they're like, how did I miss this? As, okay. It was just the drawer for a couple of weeks. Did you enjoy history when you were in school? Was that a class you loved? So in fifth grade, my she, Mrs. Bruin Slot, she loved history. And she really, I think, was the first person to really have me get, and it's something that I really use now, uh, uh, is that history is something that happens to individual people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, we learn about wars and dates and the presidents and the prime ministers and all of that. But if you take one step back off of sort of that front line, who's there? It's women and children and families, and they need to have breakfast and go to school. And, you know, so everybody's still also living through that history. And so she used to have these things like, uh, what, what is that, the Continental Congress? You know, when they all got, all those guys got together in a room and hammered out the Bill of Rights or whatever. <laughs> I'm showing my some, some kind of historical document. Yeah, they were working on, and um, you know what? So she would have something like that, and 
I always got to play Thomas Jefferson because I was the only person in my fifth grade class with red hair. Mm -hmm. So I, I had Thomas Jefferson down, but you know, by, but by sort of play acting these things, we would actually have a real experience of it. Another thing I remember her talking about was um, Benjamin Franklin. And of course we think of him as this incredible patriot and you know, all of the things he did, but his son was a British loyalist and actually moved back to England. And so you could see like just even in a family, how this history would, would, could tear a family apart. Yeah. You know, I always felt that if we learned historical fiction in school, it would be so much more interesting because when we were going to school, it was about battles, dates, and that's exactly. all you had to memorize. And you were success if you could remember the date of the battle, who would won, and blah. And that had so little to do with what was really going on of what was happening on Jeju during this time was much more interesting to see the ramifications onto actual people. Exactly. And I, I think that well, I have so much problem with the way we teach school these days, just because I think so much has changed for kids and what they need to be exposed to in a much different way. But mostly just thinking back on history of the things that I've learned by reading books is so much more than I ever learned reading in school. Exactly. And, and that's also why I love historical fiction just as a reader. Mm -hmm. I, you know, get caught up in the story. Is the guy going to get the girl? Are they going to stay friends? Who's the killer? I mean, you know, whatever, whatever the plot is, it keeps you turning the pages. But along the way, you, you do get to learn so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, the real trick, though, is you have to hope that that writer is really accurate. I, yes, they have to be stay true to the history. I mean, you can make up dialogue, but the, the facts have to stay completely clean. Yeah. yeah. I've always felt like sometimes these books should be vetted just because so many people are saying that this is the way it was. And I'm like, right, are you, or you think, I remember once I was reviewing a book for the New York Times and uh, there was something in there that I knew was wrong. And then it, you know, then it called everything else into question for me. Mm -hmm. like, if that's wrong, what else is wrong? And, and so I have, you know, I know I'm really careful. I made a mistake in the, in the Island of Sea Women, but it got corrected for the paperback. And, and you know, sometimes you're gonna make a mistake. Sometimes a copy editor doesn't catch something, you know, even though I think I've got it right, but there should be people who are, who are looking and who do. You know, another one I, time I remember with um, the Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane, there's a little chapter in there where the Haley, a girl who's been adopted and she's in like, I don't know, I'm gonna say fifth grade and she has to write a report about the Boston Tea Party. And in it, I said something like, you know, and so 275 cases of tea were thrown in Boston Harbor. And I got a note from the copy editor. Well, you know, I just looked and it was, I'm making up numbers right mm -hmm, now, right. you know, like 325 cases were dumped. And so I then stopped everything. I mean, at this point, the book is completely done, but I did, like another 30 hours of research to find out how many cases were wow. dropped in. And every single source I found had a different number. And so finally, then I had a conversation with the copy editor, like, okay, who are we gonna go with? You know, these are all reputable people. Um, and so we ended up picking, using the number that was used by a, a professor at Harvard. And so, you know, the, the theory was if anybody ever writes to me and says, no, it wasn't 325, it was, you know, 403, I said, take it up with Professor So-and-so. Right. He's the one that actually wrote that down. You know, I used to remember, I remember watching um, a show about 60 Minutes, an episode of 60 Minutes. They were talking about Tina Brown and Vanity Fair, and there were so many things that were wrong. And I said, and I trust these people about Iraq, <laughs> because I know how much is wrong in this piece right now. And I just, you know, I find that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, you're a huge supporter of independent bookstores. I know that the tour that lasted three events were three events with independent bookstores. And now as we're trying to support independent bookstores, there's a new way to be able to do that with this um, new site called thebookstore.com or bookstore.com. Can you just tell us a little it's bit about bookshop.com? Bookshop so you can go there and you can order books and it's helping to raise money to support independent bookstores, but you can also just go you know, to any bookstore, really, an in independent bookstore, whether it's in your neighborhood or maybe you have a favorite that you have visited when you've been on vacation. And almost all of them, not every single one, but almost all of them are taking orders over the phone or through the internet. 
and most of the bookstores are even offering either free shipping or shipping for a dollar. So, you know, you can still talk to a bookseller and get recommendations for what you might like to read. Or if you have kids, you know, you can say, here's their age, here's what they like, and they can make suggestions for you. So, um, you know, I, I don't know about everybody else out there, but it's hard being inside all day long day after day. Yes, you want an adventure someplace, yes. And books do take us someplace. And yeah. I know I'm grateful for, for the books that I'm reading right now. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. You pick your favorite city that you've never been to, find the independent bookseller there and order. And then you can pretend you're on vacation there. That's what yeah. I'm telling people. Just do whatever you need to do at this point. Um, you really love listening to audiobooks. Um, and I know that you and your husband frequently listen together. Did you have any hand in who did the audio for the Island of Sea Women? No, you know, they always ask me, do you like, you know, is this person okay? And I was like, I, I don't know, you know, because I don't know. The, it, usually there are people who are, um, work on Broadway. Because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, these are all usually taped in New York. So I don't know, you know, all the people who work on Broadway. Sometimes I can look them up and, and hear their voices. And sometimes I can't, but I... I have to trust the publisher on them. Just but I, I have been really fortunate that I, you know, my books have had really incredible readers. And yes, they really, really have. And at the, end, at the end of the podcast of this, we're actually going to put an excerpt from the um, audio book. So we do that so that people can actually understand, like, you know, what's going on. Um, when you read for pleasure, are you looking at how authors work their stories together or you just read for pleasure? Always. <laughs> Always. And actually, this started... Uh, so I have to tell you, I read the last line first. I've I mean, I write the last you. line first for my books, and I read the last line first for every book that I read. And then starting when I was, I don't know, whenever you start reading chapter books, like second grade, I would read the first chapter, then the last chapter, the second chapter, the penultimate chapter, and working my way towards the middle. I still read that way. Sometimes I don't, you know, I don't bother finishing the middle. Sometimes, because I figure like, well, it wasn't that good. So, <laughs> but often I, then I get to the middle and will read to the, to the end. So even though I've read backwards and forwards, when I get to the middle, I keep going. And, you know, the reason that is, is when I was a kid, I could not go to sleep unless I knew how the story ended. And so, so I, you know, so okay, even though I might have another 200 pages to go or whatever, I, at least I knew, you know, everything was going to be okay on the last page. And then, but, but what that did was, even from a really young age, I was looking, because I knew how it ended, how it was structured and how okay. it was set up. And I, you know, I've always loved mysteries. I've always loved thrillers. And so, especially with those, to see how writers lay in things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is also true for any kind of fiction, because it may not be, you know, a, a, a true mystery with a dead body, but life is a mystery. Yeah, right? and how did so, it unfold from there? That's yeah, exactly. Right? You have to lay things yeah. in so that when there are different kinds of revelations or when somebody re reacts in a certain way, you, you have had some hints along the way about it. So that has always fascinated me. So when you read, you're definitely like looking at, wait, look, how did they do that? That was a really good construction. That was a really good yeah. way they pulled it together. When you're doing the audio, do they ever come to you about the pronunciation of words? Do they yes. shoot back to you about that? Okay, yeah. so I'm just curious about that. So you are known for having spoken to hundreds of book clubs through the years. And it's something that I know you enjoy doing. You like the interaction with the readers. Tell us what that's like for you. And how people could get in touch right now to be doing it. Can you do it with Skype and Zoom? And what are you doing with groups these days? Yeah, so um, I get, I mean, I always have done it on Skype, um, but now people are really switching to Zoom so that they can be in, you know, in their own home and, and still gather, which I think is really great. I don't know about you, but I've been having, we've been having dinner with friends on Zoom. Oh, so that at least we, you know, see other people and it's like, here, you know, toasting. And <laughs> it's been kind of, it's, it's, it's fun. I recommend that. Um, but, but uh, I think all of us, especially if you've been in a book club for a really long time, you still want to see everybody. Mm -hmm. And like we were just talking about, it's so great to be reading right now because we are inside so much. And so, uh, you know, you just 
you can go to my website and there's a place that says write Lisa. It comes right to me. I'm the only person who reads them, the only person who responds. So, you know, be dressed. <laughs> no, 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 no naked photos or anything. Um, and then, but also you can just write to me directly at Lisa at lisac.com, which is where you would go if you got went to the website. But, you know, again, if you go to the website, there's all kinds of stuff for book clubs. Um, you know, like I said earlier, photos and yeah, there's a lot. You know, there's a lot of resources, all, you know, activities, and all kinds of things. Yeah, I know that when we did this with the book club. They said, "Wow, we were out there for hours trying to figure out, like, you know, look at all these pictures and backgrounds." And I think that's a great experience. Um, I have a copy here, actually, of On Gold Mountain that I found on my shelf when I was looking for books. One of yours I've never read, which was your first book. My Not very first book. Very first book, nonfiction. So I'm going to move that up my stack. So before we leave, are, what are you working on now? We don't need to know like specifics and any timing on when we're going to see that. So actually, two days ago, I finished the first draft. So that's the, the big benefit of being locked in the house is I've been really working hard. Um, this is a, I do think about books for a really long time. This one, that's 26 years I've been thinking about it. Uh, 26 years ago, I found in my grandmother's things when she passed away, a diary written by her mother. So my great grandmother, who, and so this is going to be my first sort of 100% American story. My great grandmother was born on a homestead in South Dakota. Her family continued West, homesteaded again in Washington state. She got pregnant really young, had to get married. And she and her husband, my great grandfather had really hard, hard lives. Mm. And they were itinerant workers from Alaska down to the Mexican border. And so, you know, I know on the surface, this seems very different from, from my other books, but in fact, I think it fits right in there in, in the sense of telling a story um, about a time period that I think we sort of, you know, we know from the Little House books, right? Right. But as adults, we may not have read too much about this time period, especially from the eyes of a woman. And so I'll just say just two last things really quickly. One is, you know, this kind of westward migration that is part of our American history and people going west. I guess I should be going this way for your the people on the other <laughs> watching. But, you know, going west, 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 and all of a sudden they smacked up against the Pacific Ocean. And it was like, now what? And clearly my great grandparents didn't have the answer because they kept going up and down and up and down. But this is still something that is really very much a part of our American experience of people still coming west, west, west and hitting that ocean and, and now here we all are. And uh, the second piece is that this time period that I'm writing about um, has an incredible amount of change. So we think we live in a time of tremendous change and we do but not like this time period where you go from true pioneer life to having indoor plumbing, electricity, mm -hmm. telephone, radio, movies, cars, airplanes, not TV yet, uh, then just sort of so, uh, socially and culturally, um, World War I, the last big pandemic, uh, prohibition and a woman's right to vote. And so all of those things, and you know, before I'd been saying all of those things have an impact all the way to today. I didn't know when I would say that, that that included the pandemic. <laughs> but but um, all, you know, how we live today, so much comes out of that 30 year period. You know, and I think that also it's interesting too, because I think with what's going on in the country right now, people are thinking about all over the country and what that means. We've always thought about all over the world, but right now it's what is the impact of this in Chicago and Washington and LA? And you find yourself thinking of yourselves as Americans, as all Americans, for the first time, I think in a really long time, because yes, this originated someplace else and it came and we're talking about what's happening in Europe, but we're very obsessed with what's happening in this country right now and how it's different in Montana and Wyoming than it is and what you need to do in those places is very different. So I think the timing for a book that's going to explore what happens in the United States during that time is going to be just perfect. Right. So, well, I mean, it won't come out till next year. So by then, hopefully this will be behind us. We'll be leaving the house and you can go on tour again. Exactly. And we'll meet up someplace and we'll we leave have after to, you know, tacos. Knock on wood. 
<laughs> we'll leave the house at some point and we'll have fish tacos or tea or something. We'll have to come up with our, what our thing is and tying in with the book. Lisa, as always, it is so much fun to talk to you. I have, Oops. I always, yeah, the, the, the book is, the book is telling me it's time to go. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. Really, thank really appreciate you, Carol. it. You're just the best. We all love you. Oh, thank you so much. And to our readers, we'll be back soon with another interview. Hope you enjoyed this one as much as we did. Thank you so much.